What is up, Fit Pros? I want to welcome you to another episode of the Fit Pro Business Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is a brand new series where I'm going to be interviewing in the trenches fitness business owners, and we're going to be learning about their start in the industry, their successes, and their struggles with their business, as well as what keeps them motivated. So if you're wanting to move your business forward faster and learn from business owners that are currently doing it, then stay tuned in. Today, I have the great inter- luxury of interviewing Robert Linkful. Robert, how's it going? Very well. How are you? I'm doing well. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Linkle. Linkle. Yeah, pretty close. <laughs> I was close. Thanks for the correction. Yeah, so I'm Robert good. is the owner of Be Strong in Sacramento. So tell me, Robert, how long have you been in the industry? Well, I started in uh, 1999 working as an independent. Um, 2004, I started at a private country club here in Sacramento. And uh, country club, like the ritziest place you can think of. They had <laughs> Mercedes logos on the towels. They handed you water. When you walked in, like, you know, seven different pools, the Ritz. Uh, I was there for 10 years, worked my way up to being a fitness director there, and uh, eventually uh, didn't really like the whole the whole management scene. I wanted to stay in the trenches and keep training. So I uh, left this big fancy country club to rent space in a, in a garage uh, where I had a, a roll-up door and four walls, and that was it. And uh, trained there for 18 months until we were able to save up enough money to, to move into the space we're in now. So awesome. it's been, been a road. We've done a little bit of everything and had a lot of experiences there, but uh, couldn't be more happy. So. And how long have you been in your new place? Since 2014, we've been here. Yeah, nice. yeah it's been great. Yeah, my story is kind of along the same lines. I worked for somebody not quite for that long, but for about two years, I've always been in a small studio. Mm-hmm. But when I branched off on my own, I opened a little 400 square foot office space nice. um, just to save money and see if I can actually make it fly was there for about eight months and then branched into my location where I'm at now, which is about 2000 square feet, still really small, but, um, I've been there for about 13 years now. So yeah, uh, that's the same size we have here too. We have 2000 square foot, kind of a rectangular area where we do the majority of our training and then another 500 with restrooms and an office, that kind of stuff. So I think that's perfect. You know, too many people jump in and, and get something too big and then yeah. they have trouble filling it rather than starting like you did with a small space overflowing out of that you know, let the demand meet, you know, what you go and pursue from that point rather than uh, hope, hopefully the supply will be demanded. Right. Yeah, and exactly. Will show up. Yeah. I've seen and that. I, I talk about that. that quite a bit. A, a lot of me starting in that 400 square foot office was actually guidance from my wife. I know you and your wife work together as well. So, so my wife was like, you know, if you're going to make this thing, cause I needed, I'm the, so I was a sole breadwinner at that time. Cause my wife stayed mm-hmm. home with our two girls when they were little. And she's like, if you're going to make this thing fly, you're going to have to show me how you can, you know, actually pay our bills. So absolutely, we drew it out and she's like, well, you're going to have to start with, you know, bare bones. And so I was like, okay. And so we just found a small space and from there just started picking up clients and, yeah. and grew from there. So yeah. otherwise I would have probably taken out loans and had my a state of the art facility and then had trouble filling it, which is a lot exactly. what happens to a lot of guys that get into the industry. Yeah, if you get yourself established, you know, at a minimum budget and you're building your reputation and your referrals are coming in and such, you have something to build on and be like this, you know, we, we've got this momentum, I've got consistent income, where if we went into another space, I know at least this number of people are coming with me and now I've got more room to branch, maybe hire an employee, something like that. But yeah, the risks nowadays, just we've seen, especially here in Sacramento, I've probably seen 15 gyms that open up that are three, four or 5,000 square feet yeah. and they're here for a month, you know, three months, maybe a year and then they're shut down and it's yeah. turning into something else. You know, it's just as with most industries, you have to start at the entry level and work your way up rather than jumping in to the deep end, you know? Right. And I think too, a lot of times um, business owners get ahead of themselves in regards to maybe understanding the training aspect and being mm-hmm. really good trainers, but not fully understanding the business aspect and what it actually takes and how much extra time, you know, training clients and running a business takes. There's a lot, there's a lot of time invested there that most people don't know about. Yeah. The, the managers that we think just sit around all the time in the office, they're <laughs> dealing with a lot of stuff. <laughs> right. And that, that range, I mean, just, from from the materials needed of the gym, the yeah. restrooms and the, the you know the hiring the cleaning people, paying the internet, the you know the the service for security or alarm, like paying for your internet and your 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 music service, and it's just all these things. You're like, I just want to train clients. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you got this budget that you had no idea existed. You know. 
on top of marketing and sales. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in your equipment and upgrades and everything else. Absolutely. Now, obviously you started, you know, at that ritzy club, you mm-hmm. learned a lot in management. What are some of the things you learned in management that you tra- trans that you were happy that you knew that you transitioned into running your own business? You know, the, I think the big one that I got was that I, I had a hard time trying to fit somebody else's mold. And I, and I know that, um, that's kind of ego and it's, it's like my way is the best way. Um, but when you, as part of learning, like I always say, if you go to a conference and you're like, I didn't like any of the speakers here, but you stayed and you learned from each of them, you learned about a bunch of things that maybe you didn't know about, or you learned that you don't like those and you're not interested yeah. in them, but you still learn something, right? Absolutely. So even though I was running and implementing someone else's system and someone else's way of delivering service and learned that I didn't really like that model or I didn't like that approach. And, um, when I was there, you know, for my first four years, I had earned my master's degree and I put in my letter of uh, resignation. I was getting ready to leave. And they said, why are you going? And I said, I can't grow my model here. I can't, you guys are restricting me. And so we really don't want you to leave. If we just leave you alone and let you run your own thing here, would you stay? And I said, absolutely. So they, they basically financed me to run my own business inside their business. Oh, wow. And uh, they had like a thousand square foot space in the back of the cardio area. They built a wall you know, made a room. I was able to put in my own equipment in there. And, uh, from 2008 until 2014, I ran in that space and it gave me that opportunity to basically practice like what it would be like to draw up my own facility, to finance equipment, to go yeah. through all this. And I just, I got to do it with house money, so to speak, you know, yeah. if things went belly up, then they made a bad investment, but it wasn't, you know, attached to me necessarily. Right. So I had good practice, which not everybody gets. I understand that. Right. But, you know, learning that those experiences are, are out there. And then I had the chance to, to go through and try different models. I was learning under other managers at the same time, too. And, and you know, kind of came to a, a funnel point where I saw all the things that I wanted to do, mm-hmm. the ones that I didn't, and then finding the people that believed in that model as well. So one of the other things is I'm, I'm not a huge fan of finding employees. I'm a big fan of building employees, yeah. where I would rather have an internship you know, someone that comes in, they spend, you know, three, four months with me, they get school credit, you know, for being here, I get three or four months of on the job training with them. And if they are, you know, near graduation, up to the par of what I want, we can hit the ground running, I've got my new employee, I had three or four months of training that I didn't have to pay them for, right. And we kind of got them built up to the point where I'm like, okay, you can get in here and start training our way. But they also don't know any other way. You know, the model they know is my model. Uh, where if I brought in someone that's been established for 20 years, they're like, well, I don't, I don't do it that way. I like to do it this way. We're just going to clash the whole time. You right, know? right. So learning what system that I wanted to run and, and figuring out how to, to build that and implement that. And then also finding the right employees that I could kind of build the right volunteers more or less to come in and, and learn my way and believe in that way. Those were the two big things that I, I took away from that and have implemented here. And we've, you know, being your own boss, there's a lot of responsibility like you were talking about, uh-huh. but so rewarding. It's so nice to not have anybody else, you know, they're making decisions, things you disagree with, you know, right. it's hard for me to run something that I don't believe in. Right. And yeah, that's definitely. the beauty of being on your own. And I love that. I love that you were able to kind of just figure out, you know, your model, figure out what worked for you and that you were able to do that in house for somebody that doesn't have that ability, but maybe thinks that somebody has a model that they would like, you can always learn from that person Mm -hmm. by reaching out to them or by going and um, getting mentorship from them as well. Yeah. I've yet to, to run into someone in our industry where if you asked, could I come over and observe you for a day? Could I take you to lunch and ask some questions that they say, no, I've yet to have that experience. Even, you know, Mike Boyles and Todd Birkins and some of the big names, like, you know, you, you may have to pay for their services, right. uh, but they're willing to communicate and to oh, talk yeah. on social media and to answer questions. Like there aren't a lot of people, if any out there that will just say no, you know, that I'm, this is my secret way and I'm going to do it, you know, or right, yeah. if they have, if you like, if you love what they're teaching and they have a mentorship or an internship that is, is you know, you have to pay for invest in it. I've, I've spent forty thousand dollars fifty thousand dollars in continued education over 21 years of doing this yeah I mean, i go to eight or ten conferences a year i've done five or six internships and you know i have certifications and such that i got in the beginning but from that point on it's like let's really dial this in i want to learn from those people and i'm like that i want that right, right. go and learn from those people i think it's such a great investment 
That's Absolutely. something I learned from the Cosgroves, you know, is it's not a cost if you're getting something out of it, some great return, that's an exactly. investment. And I also that like you. that you said it's important that you pull out one thing that when you go to these conferences that you pull out one thing from each person that's speaking, whether it's something you like or something you don't like. Mm -hmm. But the other key, once you pull those things out is to implement, you know, what it is that you like and what you think might work for your business. Absolutely. So what kind of model do you guys run at, at your place? Do you do uh, we run a uh, semi-private personal semi training. Private. Yeah. So 30 minute training sessions, most of our clients are 35 plus. I know that you've narrowed down your specific target market. How did you come to that? Who, you, who it is that you serve and how, you, how you've grown your business? Yeah, that's a great question. I have like an hour long answer. To that. <laughs> but the, the, the 90 second version is um, I, my intention was I was a hammer thrower track and field at, at Sac State and I was sponsored by Reebok and I was pursuing the Olympics and wanted to do all these great things in the world of throwing. Yeah. And uh, I ended up getting injured. I blew up my back. Uh, I had to have surgery in my back. I, well, I was not very talented. So I overtrained myself so much, like three or four times as much as anyone else would, and just destroyed my body. And so after my back injury, I wrote an article about it. We published in the local newspaper and the local article uh, magazine in, in our uh, country club. And members all heard about it. And those with back injuries all started coming into me. And next thing I knew, I'm, went from working with, you know, 20, 30 year olds that wanted to be our uh, power athletes to, uh, you know, half my clientele kind of 40, 50, 60 year olds that had back mm -hmm. injuries. And then uh, I was diagnosed with lung cancer. I had a carcinoid tumor in my lung and had that taken out and I had a tumor in my thyroid and had that taken out. Both my hips were trashed. I had hip replacements. I've had a hernia repair. I've had my wrist repaired twice. I've had all these uh, injuries, the majority mm -hmm. of them self-inflicted. Uh, with exception of the cancer, but I've, I've made all that, you know, public information. I've shared my experiences with mm -hmm. people and just through that, um, that experience and my, I have a kind of a mindset as soon as I'm into something, like I have to learn everything I can about that. So mm -hmm. as I would learn more about each of these things, more clients would just kind of gravitate to it. And next thing I knew, a majority of my clients were 60 and up. I've got, uh, we have 125 members here. I train about 80 of them. Uh, we run a semi-private model, Yeah. though I have somewhere between six and eight people every hour. Mm -hmm. uh, we do 60-minute workouts. Some of our clients stay a little extra, have some some pre and post stuff that they do. And, uh, you know, our average client's 64 years old. So, you know, I've got clients in their 90s. I also have their grandkids who are, you know, 19 and 20 that are going off to college. But yeah. the majority of our clients are up in, you know, 67 years old. Yeah, that's awesome. I've, I've found for me personally, you train the clients that are upwards in age like 60 plus is very rewarding because it's not about you know vanity or you know just you know losing weight it's really about longevity and them feeling good gaining All regaining their strength regaining their balance they want to be able to keep up with their grandkids great grandkids possibly um and that's for me is really rewarding plus on top of that just the conversations and the stories there are people that you know i really i personally really enjoy working with and i think that um, it for the right personal trainer for the right person that has you know that right mentality to service that specific demographic it's huge rewards when, when you've had um, opportunities in your life that have restricted your mobility and injury you know if you've thrown your back out really bad if you've had to have a surgery if you've had a life-threatening disease of some sort and then you get to work with older people and you've experienced or shared some of those same things, you have a whole different appreciation for it. Yeah. So yes, it's great to help someone increase their vertical jump or to help them bench more or learn how to clean more efficiently or something along those lines. But when you have a, a direct effect on someone's quality of life, their ability to take care of themselves longer in their years or to not rely on anyone else or to continue to be independent, uh, there's, a, there's a huge pride point there for me, uh, where I love being that person that helps them, you know, do that. Um, uh, because I've been there, I've had those experiences and, you know, I, I know that I'm, I'm 38, I'm not permanently in those States having to rehab through a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, but it gives them a really good experience and a good comfort knowing that I've gone through a lot of the things they've gone through and experienced some of those and that we can kind of relate and, and establish that connection right away. So it, you nailed it when you said it's very rewarding. It, it, it truly is. And if you can be passionate about working and patient working with older people, then, you know, it, you don't, you don't go to your job every day. You're, you're not going to work, you know, like that's just your calling now. This is what right. you do. And I, I, I couldn't be happier, you know, doing what I'm doing and 
love teaching other pros how to do it. Yeah, that's awesome. Now you've been running your business for quite some time. What has been the biggest struggle for you in your business and what are some of the ways that you've overcome it? You know, we, because we're a studio and we're not membership, we get a lot of people that will either walk by or drive by traffic that you know, they want to come in for $19 a month. Like we're, uh, you know, a big box gym. Right. And, and so we'll get them in and we'll go through the whole process, all this. And then they go, how much is it a month? And I'm like, that's $240. And we tailor every workout and everything's personalized. It's $30 a workout. You come at least eight times. And, you know, we've gone through these steps to, you know, the, the whole client consultation, the interview, we've gone through our assessment with them. We go through all of that. And, uh, and then they're like, well, I was just looking for a $20 membership. You know, that's way out of my price range. And so it was a new approach for us in the beginning to, to really kind of get away from like the traditional marketing techniques. Uh -huh. And so we don't look for lead generations at all. We look for referral generations. Yeah. We want people to come from our people. Definitely. So then they know more about us. They know more about the background of what we are. You know, they've had an experience to kind of vet mm -hmm. who we are in our service via their friend or their family member. So we completely, 100%, we do zero external marketing other than just highlighting our clients on our social medias and our emails, yeah. which is basically a referral opportunity, right? Definitely. And so we highlight those people and we'll have events. We do a lot of events here, holidays, we do socials, we have parties, we do a lot where there's always an invite to bring someone with them to experience the, the environment. So that was a big one for us was we spent a lot of money in the beginning trying to market and trying to get lead generations people yeah. just cold calls off the street and walk-ins and uh we really didn't want that demographic we didn't want that you know that clientele that there's anything wrong with them right. we just knowing the size and the model that we run we really wanted referrals so we we had to change that and um getting our our system and our philosophy of how we were going to train dialed in uh -huh. that took us a long time and it's, it's something that I like to teach now when I go out and speak and get the opportunities to go to conferences, but it's getting, uh, you know, we all have our own philosophies, our own ideas, but it's in our heads. We haven't put it down on paper exactly. yet. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, how are you going to teach that to your employee when you're like, ah, just make shit up as I go along like this, you know, <laughs> I, I need to have this process. I need to have it all done up. So once you kind of sit down you're like drawing all this up and put it, it was a, a couple of years. So I really got it defined well enough where I wanted to teach my employees, mm -hmm. but also where I want to teach our interns, where I want to reach out and teach other professionals. And now it's been like five or six generations of that where it's still continuing to improve. So it was like figuring out who we are, you know, yeah, and how exactly we deliver our service on a consistent systematic approach where we can all, all trainers here can all deliver the same service. Yeah. I love that. I, I think too, it's important, like for a lot of us who are growing our businesses and bringing in additional clientele, we, we talk about referrals being one of our biggest source of bringing in new clients, but we really don't have an actual referral system. Yeah. And you talking about implementing the things that you're doing with the newsletter and highlighting clients on social media, and then also doing those mixers. Those are examples of the systems that you're using to bring in those additional referrals. And when you get referrals from your clients that are happy with your service, they're already pre-sold by your client. So it makes it a lot easier to close them on a, on a training program because they're already pre-sold. And like, what an honor too that is to know that someone oh, yes. else is out there bragging about you and recruiting exactly. you. And then and on the other side of it, like we don't offer, it's not like they're trying to get a, a free trip to Hawaii or a free month of training. Like we don't even offer that, but because we appreciate our people and we, every month we take a client to lunch and we just try to offer enough opportunities and value. And we really connect with our people when they're here. You know, we know their, their spouses, we know about their kids. Like yeah. we, they're part of our circle, you know, they're part of our, our family more or less. And yeah, absolutely. So they really appreciate that. And we're, you know, when I'm in the hospital, when they're in the hospital, we get visits and the people are concerned about you. It just shows that you're more than their trainer. Right. It That's becomes a lot so more important. than just, than just the training or the getting fit or the Absolutely. losing weight. It becomes a relationship. It becomes, yeah. a, you know, more of a, a friendship. Yeah. It's, um, you, you were mentioning with the referrals. Uh, I wrote an article for PFP magazine like uh -huh. four or five years ago, and I did just a survey, survey monkey out to all, all the fitness professionals that I have a network connection with. And we had like 125 people respond and they all said that they spend money on, um, external marketing to create leads, but that their most successful tool that they have that brings in 97% of their business was referrals. And it's like, why do we keep spending money on all this stuff thinking that that's working when really the referrals are 
that's where we get the majority, if not almost all of our business from. Yeah. So why not flip that budget and start doing more socials and more events that give you opportunities to provide more referral opportunities, yeah, right? Absolutely. It's just a different way of thinking about it that, you know, it fits our model. Now, if, it, if we were a membership gym and we had 10,000 feet to fill um, and we were worried about the numbers of people coming in, right? Then it'd be a different ball game than we would be looking for, for leads and brand new people and people that don't know about us. So absolutely. It's different I, model. I love too that you're talking about systems because, you know, like I said, me being in business with my wife for so long and when we first started in business, you know, I had my business systems, but they were all in my head and she would get frustrated with me. She'd be like, well, I don't know how to help you with, you know, this or, or that, you know, mm -hmm. if you're not going to show me how to do it and it's just in your head or you're not going to write it out for me, I can't help you. And so that's when I came, became clear on developing, you know, my business systems as far as like client tracking and invoicing and all these things that you have to have in place to run your business. But I had to get them on paper so that somebody I could slide somebody else in, my wife or an assistant to, to do the things that were taking up my time. But I need to get them out of my head and on paper and in an actual system. And you save frustration on both ends when you do that, because the individual now that's sliding in, they've got it all detailed for them. They know exactly how to do it. And then your expectations on the other side you not like, how are you not getting this? And they're like, well, I, I don't know. You're just telling me to do stuff where if I just had a list in front of me, right? A system that I can implement. So it saves frustration on both sides. The job gets done, things get delivered well. But even the most simple things that, you know, the standard operating procedures, your SOPs, mm -hmm. how you open the gym, close the gym, exactly. you got to do laundry. And when you turn the lights off, you got to clean the blinds, like all of that stuff's on rotations and things that you just, when you're a trainer and you're like, I want to go open my own gym, right? This is going to be a like, big equipment. <laughs> We're opening our doors and then you start getting into all these other things. And you're like, man, there's a lot more, yeah. you know, the last thing really becomes we get to train all the other stuff you've got to get handled first. Absolutely. So you, you need to keep your doors open. There's a lot there, but it's podcasts like this and webinars like this that allow people to be aware of those things and to learn about them and, and know like, oh, this is out there. I got to learn more about this because I didn't go to business school. You know, I right. went to school for kinesiology, learn how to train. So when you get here and you're like, oh, there's no more schooling. There's not like personal training business school. It's not in our certifications, right? Right. You have to go find Cosgroves or Thomas Plummer. Or you got to, you know, you got to go find a mentor. Like you mentioned earlier, you got to find somebody that's, that's been there and they've done it. They're still doing it. And they're going to teach you. Exactly. Because ultimately somebody that's having success, success leaves clues. And like you said, just as reaching out to somebody is most of the time, all these guys started where you are. Nobody got to where they are overnight. They've all put in their time. And so they know what steps you're at and how to help you get to the next level. And good mentors aren't afraid to teach you those next steps. You know, yeah, we've absolutely. had guys that are like, yeah, I'll get help get you rolling. And then you're like, what's next? I'm like, hey, you don't know, buddy. You're going to have to figure it out, you know, because <laughs> they're afraid of the competition. But, yeah, you know, we've got 317 million people in our country and we've got 280,000 personal trainers right. listed by IRS, right? So that should be like, 450 clients for each of us. There's a lot of people out there that <laughs> right. need us, right? And then, you know, 85% of them have some kind of, you know, uh, they're overweight, obese, they have some kind of heart, heart disease, something. So it's like, we have plenty of clientele. Right. To pick. It, it shouldn't be a concern for us to, to feel like we're going to lose out to somebody or if you're teaching someone else how to do it, that you're going to lose this, you know, the, the magic, the mystery of what you do. It, it all comes down to the same equipment and the same things. It's, your personality, it's your system, right. it's how well you run things, the connections you make with people. And then, you know, can you ultimately help them improve and get better? You know, it's, we got to go learn from people that have done that and Absolutely. Know how to, and that we connect with, you know. Now talking about your systems, as far as training, how over the, over the years did you come to isolate exactly what it is that works for you? And, and now how, how are you teaching that? Yeah, we, we had a really great staff uh, over at the country club and, there were probably 13 of us. Mm -hmm. I think I had two that were like my, I had a, a head of strength and conditioning and the head of personal training that I oversaw both departments and uh, got the three of us together and our office assistant. And we're like, we got to get a system. Like how, how are we all delivering a service right now? Cause we're all kind of on the same page. We're all doing similar things because we all work together and we see it. Right. But how are we going to teach new people? How are we going to make sure it's consistent? So we came out, big whiteboards, we created a list and we had like 13 exercises that everybody should know how to do. You know, eight different components that we should be able to put into every workout from mobility to cool down, movement prep, 
you know, if they had a limitation, what would we work on to, to help improve those areas? What would our main strength focus be? What would our Metcon or our conditioning component be if they were a power athlete? So we just started making lists of each one. And by the end, we had so many things, it was overwhelming. <laughs> right. Like, this is just too much. You know, it's too much to think about. So we tried to funnel down each one of those to make that like, what, what's the main part that we need to focus on? And so maybe movement prep and cool down and warm up all kind of became one thing. And we just mm -hmm. called that movement prep. And then we had our strength training and power could kind of come into that, and whichever one they'd be, you know, strength or power, it would split. And then we just had our, our Metcon, you know, our conditioning component. And so now we have our three pieces and then what movement patterns out of each one of those do we feel like are most important? Well, we want to do a horizontal row and, and a vertical row and we want to do a, a horizontal push and a vertical push. And we want to have some kind of loaded carry, something where we split our feet and then some kind of core based component. So we split all that and we want to have a twist. Then we kind of funnel that down. We're like, well, with the older adults, the overhead stuff wasn't that important for us necessarily. But they pull better than they push. We don't really need to horizontal push at all with them carries and the loaded stuff we don't need to do twisting and core work with them they're going to get that through the carries and so we just started chopping away and chopping away and eventually it came down to five things so we have a, a row we have a split stance we have an overhead action we call it we have a loaded carry and and then we have our hinge and those are the five pieces that we look at every day we've got a list of basic materials basic exercises we teach first slightly more advanced and then our most advanced and we teach it just like we would like a block calendar in, in school you have week one and week two, and we build it across until they know all of it or they can do the majority of it. And then it's just free reign. So we have a system, we have a blueprint, we have an idea of what movement patterns every day. We, we control all of our volumes, rep sets, loads, tempos, recoveries, all that. Mm -hmm. And so we have those things set, but what hinge, what row, what split, what order, what interval, that's totally up to the trainer. So we still give each of us the, the variety to like make, I always use the Cosgrove cookies, as an example, you need milk and butter and, you know, you need all this yeah. stuff and they got to go in for 15 minutes. But beyond that, I can make it whatever I want. Do I want ice cream? Do I want frosting? Do I want chocolate chips? Or you, you, you just need the system. You need yeah. the approach. And then once that's done, I can be as creative with that as I want. Because what I didn't want to do was just say, I'm going to write all the workouts and you guys do them. Yeah. Well, now they're not learning. They're not creative. They don't have investment. Now, like we started off talking about running someone else's system you don't mm -hmm. believe in. Right. Now I'm doing that to them. Right. So if they believe in this philosophy and the way that I teach it and we come in and they're like, yes, I agree. I think this is fantastic. I give their input as well if there's ever changes. And then, you know, from that point on, they've got some ownership and belief in it and they get to create their own stuff and it's just a, a way we go. You know, they are, they are responsible for their own yeah. content. I'm still checking it and making sure it's yeah, yeah. You know, abiding by the laws of the system more or less, but they have free reign to do what they want. I love that. So yeah. you've given them the system or the structure to follow for the training program, but then yeah. they have free reign as far as how they're going to implement it. Absolutely. And so that gives them that sense of ownership in regards to what they're doing. I love that. Yeah. Cause in the beginning, like when we first start off, I will be like, you just kind of follow what I'm doing here as I'm teaching it. And you know, you have a client with a bad back, we have bad back workouts, we have hip issues, shoulders, like we build each of those pieces every day. And then they'll kind of see that. And after a couple of months, they're like, okay, I want to start doing this with my shoulder group. And I'm like, good, it fits the model, do it. And then slowly they start having their own boards, right? Yeah. Our whole gym, we've got 20 different whiteboards all the way around the gym. And so every day we come in and I'm here two hours before we start. And I'm writing all my clients up on the board, writing all their workouts, all their little pieces. And it's the same as if I were programming it in Excel or Word or, or yeah. any you know, PT manager, any of these other things. I just do it on the whiteboard. And then we just take a picture of that and we store it at the end of the day. And that's our, our system. So I know exactly what we did and, and how we did it. It's not changeable if there's ever a legal issue. It's yeah. an actual picture of the board that we did that day. <laughs> you know, So it's all there. They know exactly as it is. But the client also gets to come in. And they see their name and they see their critiques. And they know that you didn't just you know, plug in a cookie cutter workout and be like, yeah, that's you today. You forgot me. And you didn't even <laughs> think about it. But that's yeah. you, right? You come in and you're like, here's Andy and here's his shoulder and his you know, his back issue, and we're going to modify this and change that. And you know, I also remember he likes golf, so we're going to do the golf burnout at the end. And they go, oh, he built this great workout just for me, but I'm also in here with eight other people, right? Yeah. And these other people, one guy's got a hip replacement, the other lady's going through cancer treatment. You know, the other two are skiers. Well, we all train together. It's the camaraderie of the, of the group, the social facilitation of training yeah. with others. But it's still personalized. Still personalized, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.
I love that. So now that you've been in business for quite some time, I'm really big on setting projections for what your next goal is or what you see foresee for the future of your business. Um, what do you have kind of as your big vision for your business? We have another space next to us that we want to take over eventually. Uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a business right now that they have the ability to move to another location. So we're actually kind of working on influencing them to go. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm hoping that happens at some point. Uh, we'll knock down walls and merge into that space. And as far as this business goes, I have no desire to franchise or open a second location. I'm really happy doing this. I just would love like another 800 feet. If I could just have another 800 square feet to have more movement, warm up prep area, I'd love yeah. to have a little turf where we could do some prowlers and you know sled work and bear crawls and stuff on the ground. Right now we have to go do all that outside or we do it on mats on the floor. So I'd love to have that. And then uh, that would also give us room to hire another employee or two where we'd have more room in the gym to, to do some more training. And then beyond that, at some point you know, down the road, I'd like to step away from training a little bit. I think I'll always train. I'll be in here yeah. at least three days a week, but uh, I'd like to step away a little bit and do more teaching. I love, love coaching. I love working with other trainers and especially those that are, you know, they're really interested in working with the older demographics. It's such a neglected demographic. It is, yes. are afraid to work with them. And they're afraid to hurt them. They don't know what to do. And I can teach both of those things. So if I can help establish that and get more professionals moving in that direction, I would feel very accomplished in doing that. So those are, those are the goals. That's awesome. Now, how can the um, other fit pros learn more about you? How can they connect with you? Yeah. Uh, if you go to trainingtheolderadult.com, that's our, our main landing page for our education. Uh, we have a webinar series on there. We do um, independent solution sessions. I've had Nick Tuminello, I have Lauren Landau coming, Brett Bartholomew, uh, Evan Osar. I got a bunch of other pros coming up. Um, so we do the majority of our online education through through Zoom, through webinars, and we also mm -hmm. do live events here at the gym. Uh, you can check me out on Facebook, on YouTube. I have 80 videos on YouTube, hour-long videos showing how we do our hinges and how we teach our clients to properly pick up things, all kinds of stuff. There's, I got a lot of free information out there, so feel free to check that out. And I'm on Instagram as well. And then if you're ever in town and you want to swing by, you know, I'm right here in the heart of Sacramento. Uh, I'm always happy to have people come in and, and hang and observe for a little bit, ask some questions. We go to lunch afterwards. Um, you know, I, I love this profession that we're all able to, to network yeah. and connect and we can all learn something from each other. So I'd be happy to have people in anytime you're here. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm going to actually um, include all of those in the show notes. Now, do you have any last golden nuggets, business golden nuggets, words of wisdom that you'd like to leave the other fit pros with? The, uh, the, the one thing that I love the most um, and, and that I like to teach people the most is that you are going to have uh, opportunities in this profession to make great deals of money, but it might not be doing what you want to do. And I really like to think and encourage people to pursue what you like to do, what you want to do and money, you know, the, the financial return in that, if you are good at it, will come. Don't just take the the big money, you know, big money up front. And and the, the an example for that is I have a, a a good friend of mine who's great at boot camps. He's he's excellent at running it. He hates it. He he doesn't like it at all. But he makes two hundred fifty grand a year running these boot camps. And every day it's like a drag for him to get in there. And he's got to motivate himself. And he's got to put on yeah. the show. And he and he just doesn't. You know, it's not something that if he was super passionate about, which working with athletes in a one-on-one -on -one format, he does, you see a whole different emotion come out of him, a whole different connection. And, and, and so to me, I'm like, just, I would merge away from the boot camps and just start doing the thing that you love the most. And if you're excellent at that and the money will find, you know, it'll, it'll find you. Uh, the reputation will speak for itself. You, things will take off from there, but it's easy in our industry in the beginning to just train anyone and everyone. And you need to do that because you don't really know what you want to do yet. Yeah, right. Absolutely. But as you start to find that thing that you're just so passionate about, don't let anything deter you, even really decent money in another direction, or it might be an opportunity to go to management and take you away from training. And that was one of the bigger mistakes I made. I, I, yeah, I got to learn from that, but being pulled away from what I went to school for and everything and at 30 years old, I'm like, what am I, what am I doing this for? What yeah. did I put all this time into this for? to sit in an office and watch other people do it. You know, like we have to go through those steps. I get it, but follow, follow what you are really passionate about and, and the financial returns will come. I'm, I'm very certain of that. I'm, I'm a big believer in that. And the more 
effort and intention you put behind that, I believe it will come true. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's important too, like we talked about setting those systems in place so that you don't become a slave to your business. Because even if you really, really love what you're doing, but you're like overworking yourself 14, 16 hours a day, you can really burn yourself out and start to lose passion for what it is that you initially had passion for. And that's where those systems come into place where you can actually set other people in and then you can focus on staying passionate about your business and growing your business. Yeah, it's nice to be able to take a week long vacation and not lose money. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But, but that took 10 years for me to build a system that would allow that, you know, so it you. takes time, but it is very doable. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more, Robert. Hey, I want to thank you for your time and all the value that you've provided to other fit pros. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on today, everybody. I appreciate you. And if you ever have any questions or anything comes up, you know how to get a hold of me. Awesome, man. We'll connect soon. Cool. Thank you.